Hallelujah. Hey, Lorana, take this for me. Just hold it for me. Thank you, O Father God. Hallelujah. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you, O Lord God, for your healing power, your delivering power. Thank you, Lord God, for answering our prayer. Jesus said you would do whatever we ask, especially if it was in your will, O Lord God. So we thank you for doing what it is that we have asked, we have agreed upon, we dare declare is done. We believe we receive it now in Jesus' mighty name. Amen, 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 amen. Give God thanks. Give him praise. Give him glory. Hallelujah. You can go ahead and be seated as you greet someone on your way down. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Good morning, everyone. Glad to see your beautiful faces on this morning. So that's something that I had to deal with. I don't know if I'll, I'll be sharing. I may not share her experience. That's, that's one. Uh, that, was a, that was a different level. Uh, like I said, there's not a new evil that showed up. It's an ancient evil that has rose up. <clears throat> Still got a little echo up here. Let me know if I need to switch. Do y'all hear an echo coming out of this microphone? You do? All right. I'll talk just a couple more minutes more, and if they don't get it straight, I'll just switch over to the next microphone, I'm trying to play these games with these speakers. But testing one, two. Yeah, I'm not going to. I'm not going to fool with that. Let me switch to this. All righty. That's a little bit better. Whew. So, uh, you know, there are some things that are above the level of the pay grade the church is on right now. There are some things that are just completely raw evil. Evil is evil, but there's some stuff that's in a different category. And so there are very few, few things that shake me. I knew I had to share it with my wife at the right time because my wife is a feeler. She can, whatever you are, wherever you are, she can feel you. And so, uh, and that comes with a lot of emotion. So even a lot of times if you see her, she just break down crying and weeping just because she can feel you. My wife can feel you and she can tell you if you were on drugs 20 years ago. And so, hold on one moment. I gave you my cloth because um, I was looking at my uh, videos and I noticed that I fidget too much. By the time I get through a serving, I didn't fold it that tall about 100 times. Jesus like, you do not work at the doggone clothing store. So I'm going to just start giving stuff to my wife. And I drink the water too much, too. Y'all like, we know that. We've been watching you. When we had the uh, impartation service, you know, you're supposed to fold the cloth. And I'm, I would like that video. I said, how come nobody told me the cloth is sitting on top of my head like a bird? I was like, that I was looking so crazy. You know, so, but let me warn you all. Let me, I'm going to make myself very, very clear with something that everyone has to settle in their heart. I am never against anyone. There are some people that because of how they are raised, if I have to tell them something, they think it's because I don't want them to rise. Wrong. It's because I want you to rise. And I was telling the staff this morning that Kenneth Hagin said that um, Jesus told him that most ministers do not get to the first phase of their ministry before they die. So watch this. If the leader didn't get to his first phase, where are you going? And people think phases is numbers. Mm -mm. They, they, you know, because nobody teaches what the phases are. I literally, the last couple of weeks, just stepped into another phase. And when you step into the phases, you don't step into it just because of nilly willy. You know, you have these conferences, you know, where you can go and get a triple anointing. Dude, you don't even know the people in the congregation. You gonna give them a triple anointing and a double anointing and a large anointing. No, 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 no. You have to pay a price for that. There's a price that has to be paid for anything that God gives you. There is a stiff price. And the price is the warfare that you have to go into and the testing. Right before you are promoted, 
you will feel like you had just gone through a scenario where you were getting ready to die. Okay? And so uh, we put that text graphic up just for a moment as we settle. Just have a very simple, I'm going to share just something for a moment, and Eric is going to just uh, read a passage of scripture and give you a word, and I'm going to come back and read that passage of scripture from another angle and then give you a final word. You know, the fast technically is over, even though some people are fasting with that graphic, I believe they put up, yes. If you want to be informed in all that we do, you know, just text your, whether you're a member or not, or online or not, um, just text Lionheart Church to that number. Make sure that there are no spaces. Some people said it didn't work. It's because you had spaces, no spaces in between the letters um, to keep you abreast because I'm, I am beginning to transition out of, you know what, uh, I'm going to say a strange statement. At a different dimension, you hear different things. And you have to settle yourself. I was in front of the mirror and the Holy Spirit said, there's a difference between religion and Christianity, and there's a difference between Christianity and the kingdom of God. And he said, you just moved over to the kingdom of God and came fully out of Christianity. <laughs> See, the statement in by itself is crazy. But God never called us Christians. The people did in the book of Acts. It says the people were first called Christians by people in the community. And like I said, no, let me see you out here marching. We ain't not Christians. I don't, I don't even know you. Come on, Pastor Arthur, join me. No, no. I'm going to Burger King. I'm not joining this foolishness. I ain't, I ain't got time for marching. You know, but um, so we've entered into a new phase. And so I'm going to be doing things differently. And, and we're going to finally flip the script on this and go out. I was listening to this to this dude on uh, social media. And he said something was so good. He said, he said, if you go and study the book of Acts, he said, unbelievers were usually not invited to meetings like this. When you study the book of Acts correctly, it, it says the people gathered amongst themselves. And Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 14, he said, if a believer happens to come in or stumbles in, this is what you do. And so what we did is, is that, I shouldn't say we, the, the enemy convinced the church to just bring everybody to the church to hear one guy. And nobody else do the work of the ministry. And the work of the ministry will be us all inviting people to one building. And that's been in us so long in the church that it's hard to break away from it because then you look strange. And when people are convicted by your strangeness, they got to make you look strange instead of themselves. And so this is us switching this back, and some people are gonna, not going to like it because they're used to coming and just sitting. And But the reason why there is no revival is not because it's not enough prayer. They didn't pray it enough for revival. It's not going to come because it was not based on prayer, just like the book of Acts revival was not based on prayer. It was based on people doing the work of the ministry. Think about it. If every party in this room had to focus on, if we just, the old system, if everyone in this room had to focus on getting one disciple here in the next month, or you couldn't go to heaven, how many know you have five of them here just in case a couple drop off? <laughs> wouldn't you? you? You It wouldn't be a thing of, oh, I can't go to heaven unless I get one disciple in the next month? You'd be reading John 3, 16, Romans 10, 9, and 10. Man, you will become an international evangelist overnight. You all of a sudden would be in the word and in prayer. You would be inviting people and talking to people. You wouldn't bypass people at the grocery store. You'd talk to your neighbors that you've been around for 10 to 20 years. There are some people, they're just professional churchgoers. And that's what has been training. So we're switching that. Okay. So, but based on that, I'm going to leave that water alone. I'm going to be smooth now. I was like, how many times are you going to drink water? You are not at the gym. That's how you have to judge yourself because you can't see yourself. It's not until I looked at myself that I saw myself. You understand what I'm saying? Sorry. I got to go back and read the scripture that I have left. <laughs> All right. Let's read Daniel chapter 10 says, in the third year of the reign of King Cyrus of Persia, Daniel, also known as Belteshazzar, had another vision. Let me increase my intensity a little bit. He understood that the vision concerned events certain to happen in the future, times of war and great hardship, the time that we're in right now. 
When this vision came to me, I, Daniel, had been in mourning, not fasting. You look at every translation, it says he was not fasting. He was in mourning for three whole weeks. All that time, I had eaten no rich food, not no food. No meat or wine crossed my lips, and I used no fragrant lotions until those three weeks had passed. On April 23rd, as I was standing on the bank of the great Tigris River, I looked up and saw a man dressed in linen clothing with a belt of pure gold around his waist. Now look at me for a moment. Um, this, is, this black part is dry land, and this is the, the mighty river or ocean or sea, whatever. Um, how many of you know no one stands at the edge of the water like this, um, like this? When you went to the beach, you didn't stand there at the beach and just stand here to listen to the water behind you, did you? Nope. You stood at the bank. I only brought this up because I like to help you see little things in Scripture. He stood at the bank and he looked up. So when he's looking at this angel, the angel is either standing on the water or levitating above it. Y'all got me? I always do those things to help you kind of pay attention to Scripture more. <clears throat> Verse 6. His body looked like a precious gem. Now, I want you to think about this one moment. So when you go to the jewelry store and you see those, like, very expensive, he said his whole body looked like a precious gem. His... I always say these are not the angels at Walmart or the Christian bookstore. His body looked like a precious gem. His face flashed like lightning. What does that even look like? His eyes flamed like torches. Either his eyes glowed like those lights or there was fire literally <laughs> in his eyes. One of the things that every person says about Jesus is that when you look into Jesus' eyes, it's the ocean. His arms and his feet shine like polished bronze, and his voice roared like a vast multitude of people. How many know that is crazy? Only I, Daniel, saw this vision. The men that were with me saw nothing, but they were suddenly terrified and ran away to hide. So the men that were with him, they didn't see anything. They ran because of what they felt. <laughs> That's crazy. How many of you been somewhere and you felt evil brush past you? That's why, watch this, that's why sinners get mad at you on your job, because they felt righteousness walk past them. The man said unto me, Daniel, you are very precious to God. I'm sorry, I jumped, I'm sorry. Ooh, verse 8, I was there all alone to see this amazing vision, and my strength left me. My face grew deathly pale, and I felt very weak. Then I heard the man speak, and when I heard the sound of his voice, I fainted and lay there with my face to the ground. That's insane. Somebody says one word to you, and you instantly, boom. Then in verse 10, a hand touched me and lifted me, still trembling to my hands and knees. And the man said to me, Daniel, you are very precious to God. All of you must remember this. You are very precious to God. No matter what happens to you, you are very precious to God. No matter how many sins you committed, you are very precious to God. No matter how many mistakes you made, you are very precious to God. Regardless of how behind you are in life, you are very precious to God. The devil's job is to convince you that you are not precious in his eyes because of what you did or said or didn't do. The list goes on and on. You are very precious to God, so listen carefully to what I have to say to you. Stand up, for I have been sent to you. When he said this to me, I stood up still trembling. Then he said, don't be afraid, Daniel, since the first day you begin to pray for understanding and to humble yourself before your God. Your request has been heard in heaven. Notice the angels did not say, from the first day you were prayer at praying and fasting. He said, from the first day you begin to prayer and humble yourself. You know, you know, I hate to say this, gentlemen, but he didn't put any lotion on, so his legs were ashy for 21 days, and he ref refused to eat good food, different things like that. That's a way of humbling yourself. Your request has been heard in heaven. I have come in answer to your prayer. But for 21 days, the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia blocked my way. This is a demonic prince over a kingdom in outer space in another dimension if you switch it. Then Michael, one of the archangels, came to help me, and I left him there with the spirit prince of the kingdom of 
Persia. That's a very interesting passage of scripture. Now I am here to explain what will happen to your people in the future, for this vision concerns a time yet to come. While he was speaking to me, I looked down at the ground, unable to say a word he didn't even want to look at the dude. Then the one who looked like a man touched my lips, and I opened my mouth. Now watch this. Up until today, I realized that it was two people standing there and not one. We don't know where this man came from. Because I'm going to read it again. Then the one who looked like a man, which is tells you that the angel did not look like a man. He looked more like a, mach- a monster or a machine. So I don't know where this other guy came from. I don't know if it was his assistant. Watch this. I don't know if it was his armor bearer. <laughs> I don't know if it was another angel from heaven. I don't know. I don't know if a regular man entered into the vision. I don't know. But he said, then the one that looked like a man. And maybe it wasn't, never mind, touched my lips, and I opened my mouth and began to speak. I said to the one standing in front of me, I am filled with anguish because of the vision I have seen, and I am very weak. How can someone like me, your servant, talk to you, my Lord? My strength is gone, and I can hardly breathe. Then the one who looked like a man, certain things angels can do, certain things they can't. Then the one who looked like a man touched me again. And I felt my strength returning. Don't be afraid, he said. You are very precious to God. Peace. Be encouraged. Be strong. And as he spoke these words to me, I suddenly felt stronger and said to him, please speak to me, my Lord, for you have strengthened me now. In other words, what do you want before I faint again? He replied, do you know why I have come? Soon. I must return to fight against the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia. And after that, the spirit prince of the kingdom of Greece will come. Meanwhile, I will tell you what is written in the book of truth. No one helps me against these spirit princes against Michael, your spirit prince. Dang, this is kingdoms against kingdoms and kingdoms against kingdoms are fighting. So one dude can't get a word. That's an insane exposition in regards to what's going on in that realm of what we call outer space. Outer space is simply the space where the theater of war is taking place. And it's in another dimension. So it's very interesting because that is the war that is the warfare that just goes over proper messages. Because notice what he said, I came to give you a message. I have been warring for 21 days to give you a simple message that does not even apply to you. He said, now, another angel was sent, and I got through, but he's also fighting them. Over what? You got through. Then he said, I've given you the message. I have to go back. When I go back, he said, because two of us have the ability to lock down a million-man army all by ourselves, They said, that kingdom prince is going to call for another demonic kingdom to come to try to hold us two dudes down. And our job is to constantly fight just to get people messages, which adds to another mystery because how many read in the Bible in the Old Testament, sometimes God directly spoke to someone. See, it's a lot of mysteries about that kingdom. So where are we going? Don't go arrogantly, go lightly. Because you might know one thing, but it's another 15 you don't know. Because that's very mysterious. Remember Elijah? You know, he said the voice wasn't in the cave, wasn't in the fire, wasn't here, wasn't there. Messed that up a little bit. He stepped to the cave, and he heard a small, still voice. Well, if Daniel, he wasn't praying, and he wasn't fasting, he wasn't in mourning, he wasn't nothing. But So how come he couldn't do that with Daniel? We don't know. How come that word that uh, Daniel had to receive had to come through the voice of an angel? And if the angel doesn't get through, the dude doesn't get the message. A lot of times what we hear, we call the Holy Spirit. It's not the Holy Spirit. It was an angel. You see that in the book of Acts. Philip, the Holy Spirit and an angel work in tandem with each other to direct this man. I can't remember who spoke false. The Holy Spirit said, go this way. No. Yes. The Holy Spirit said this, go this way. And then it says an angel spoke to him after he went that way and said, get in that chariot with that man. Okay. So I said a lot. Well, let me read this next one. Okay. Ephesians 16. I'm at the end of the fast. Having a wonderful message here and a wonderful time. 
and then I'm chilling today. Don't call me and talk about Godzilla showing up in your dream and the alien that showed up at your front door with a sword and you fight him. I'm tired. <laughs> Ephesians 6.10, a final word. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. You are no longer going to be able to afford to take these scriptures lightly. I can't tell you what happened to this young lady, but when uh, after she shared this experience, I was on alert. And I was like, Lord, you know that can't happen to me because if that happened to me, I'm killing everybody. You heard the strong word that I use. And ever I use a word that I'm going to kill somebody, you better know that there is something high level that is above your pay grade that I'm dealing with. Trust me on that. You know, They told you that the leader of the Church of Satan, Timothy LeVay, he had a heart attack and died. Uh-uh. These two pastors killed him. See, ah, Jesus, we are moving into the dimension of untraceable deaths. Where things are going to be done. And now, yes, you got this war that is maxed out in the natural realm. But there's another high level thing going on in the invisible realm with the sons of God and the sons of devil. Where we both going at each other in another dimension and planet Earth can't trace it. That's the dimension that we're moving into. There's a scripture. It says when evil is not dealt with swiftly, it says the men who do evil are not fully given to it. And what you see out here is men who are fully given evil, fully given to evil. But unfortunately now, uh, they, have, they have hooked up in unison and in union with the original evil in the invisible realm. And the invisible realm has taught them to come into that realm so we can show you who we are. And then watch this. Let's show you. Let's, we're going to show you how powerful we are. Look at how we can attack Christians. And they insisted them. Because Christians are weak. It's false. Satan is Lord. And it's easy to believe that if you have been exposed to more power on the dark side than the ones who say than in the kingdom of light. It's easy to believe that. And so they're coming for you, and a lot of people think they have a defense, but you don't. Last month, I'll be teaching the defenses. Let me tell you something. Your defense is the word of God. Next month, we talk about the word from an extremely high level. I keep telling people, the word is the more sure word of prophecy. It's the safety net. Every single thing that you hear me teach, every single thing that you hear people say, every single thing that you hear can be checked by the more sure word of prophecy. Y'all understand what I'm saying? I'm just being a little bit serious. Call Ephesians 6.10, final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Everybody is supposed to be strong in the power of the Lord, not the pastors. The pastors are supposed to teach you how to walk in mighty power. What they're doing is they won't let you walk in nothing, trying to keep the power for themselves while they have none. Put on all of God's armor so that you'll be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. There is no one in this room that has the ability to see Satan's strategy against you. It is impossible. The only way you can see his strategy is what you're doing, what you're saying, what you heard. Does it line up with the book? Well, this is what I feel I don't care nothing about what you feel. I care about what is written in the more sure word of prophecy. This is what the Lord told me. I don't care nothing about what you think the Lord told you. This is what the word says. Well, it's okay because the Holy Spirit gave me special grace to get a woman on the side. I don't care nothing about the special demonic grace that you have to get another woman on the side because the book says this. Well, this is what God showed me. Wrong. That's what you saw because what you say he showed you does not line up with what he wrote down. And he will never show you anything that he didn't write down when this, y'all understand what I'm saying so you got to have on all to stand firm we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies but against evil rulers so these are individuals that rule and but they're evil and authorities of the unseen world so there are beings that have authority to do certain things from the unseen world. And against mighty, this is, like, this is God telling you, this is God's definition. He didn't call them weak. Mighty powers 
in this dark world. So some are up there and some are down here. First he told you they were in the unseen world. Now he's talking about the mighty powers in this dark world. And then he's talking about the evil spirits in outer space. What we call outer space, the Bible calls heavenlies. Therefore, because of all of these fools put on every piece of God's armor so that you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will be standing firm. When you... <laughs> she said, somebody said, good job. That's where my hope was. I could not believe how many times I folded that towel. Just in one sermon I was looking like. And I mean, I'm just folding it, and then you see the little white tag that you're supposed to cut off when you buy an item. And, and the white tag is just showing up on the camera. Somebody said, hallelujah, oh, thank you, Jesus, for opening up his eyes. And I could not believe how much I, see, what happened is I went from the microphone. Y'all remember I used to massage the microphone all the time? And my, I'll go home, my wife told me one day, if you don't leave that microphone alone. So I need to focus more. So, can't remember what I was going to say, so I'll just get to my point. <clears throat> oh, Rick Joyner was in heaven, and when he was taken there, this is very important because at this moment, I am on new territory. I have never been this far before. Okay? You know, the, the level I just came from was further than what most are, but now here, I've never been this far before. And when you, how many know when you drive to a new neighborhood, you don't drive the same way when you're driving in your neighborhood. You know, when you're driving to a new vacation spot, you don't just move around nilly-willy like an old vacation spot. And so it's very important for all of us to realize this, okay, based on another statement I'm going to make in a moment. And that is when Rick Joyner was in heaven, he said, an angel said, before we move forward, he said, put this on. And, and, and in the story, he said it looked like an old raggedy potato sack. Remember that? He said it looked like some old raggedy potato sack. And because of how everyone else in heaven looked, just glorious beams of light and beautiful clothes and armor, he said, you want me to put this ugly thing on? And he said, yes. And so an angel didn't tell him what it was. He said, put it on. And so he only put it on because the angel kept telling him, put it on. But the thing was so ugly and so drab. The moment he put it on, everybody started bowing to him. Everywhere he went. He said, why in the world are all of these people bowing to me with this ugly thing? He said, it's not ugly. It's how you see it. He said, it's, it's the highest rank in the kingdom. You're wearing the cloak of humility. And in your mind, to humble yourself looks real ugly. Can I keep going? So he, so he kept it on. Because of that, everybody's bound to him. But then, like us, his mind started getting to him because he kept looking at himself. You cannot do anything good for God, great for God, masterful for God while looking at yourself. Because you're going to make several stupid mistakes. He kept looking at himself. And finally, when the angel wouldn't have to pay attention, he, he, he said he opened it because you could open it like a button. He said he opened it. And he said his armor just shined through, bam. And so he got to looking at everyone, looking at how everyone else was shining. And when he saw that he was shining, but it was being covered up by humility, which in our minds and planet Earth looks ugly. You understand what I'm saying? With humility, you can't get your way all the time. With humility, you got to hear something that makes it seem like you're not getting ready to go anywhere when actually you humble yourself and you'll be exalted in due time. But it looks ugly at first because of how you think. So he said he opened it and that light shined through. And he said he got to looking around. Uh, skip what this angel said. He said he threw it off. <laughs> like that blind man. He said he threw it off and he was shining like the sun. Then he realized he was shining so much he could not see his hand in front of him. And he began to panic because he was shining so bright, the, the light that was coming from him was blinding him. 
he began to panic. And then he heard someone say in the distance, put the cloak back on. So he said he put it back on and he stopped shining, but he couldn't see correctly. You ever notice that when you come out of a big bright light? Oh, man. Ooh, wee, you got to adjust for a while. The moral of the story is the angel told him, he said, see, you got to look at yourself. And God doesn't want you to look at yourself. He said, you need to keep on that humility to see clearly. He said, the reason why your eyesight is off, he said, that bright light blinding you. He said, now you got to keep the cloak on for a while for your eyesight to come back. And that's what pride does. It blinds you. That's why it says it goes before a fall. It goes before a fall. Why? Pride. Why? You, you, your pride, and because you're thinking about you. You're not thinking about what is right. You're thinking about your feelings. You're thinking about you. And so you become blinded by that, and then you begin to trip, and you begin to fall. So all I have to say, I said, that, said all I have to say this. There's something that the Holy Spirit revealed to me. There was an extremely high-level war that was created over this ministry a couple of years ago. That's what the Holy Spirit told me. Just told me this a couple of days ago. I have to be totally honest with you. Since the ministry has started, these last like two, three months have been very difficult on me. In the ministry, even when we were fighting that stuff with Ariana, this was different. It was even higher level than that. Lots of there are lots of things that I cannot share with you about the last uh, three, four months, and even before it was building. So listen to me carefully. So the Holy Spirit told me. He said, and I, you know, you ever one thing about me, I know you think you deep. And I'll be saying something. So I mean, how many times you see me pray and the Holy Spirit just interrupt me like I'm not even talking? It's rude, man. No, you ain't saying nothing. It ain't rude. I don't want to hear that mess. <laughs> Sitting here trying to represent me. I need to shut you down. I was talking to my wife and the Holy Spirit interrupted me. You know, you want to say, can't you see I'm talking to my wife? Yeah, but you ain't saying nothing. <laughs> Look at your wife. <laughs> She's just looking at you. She ain't smiling. You know, you kind of feel like dumb when the Holy Spirit does that. He told me, he said, you were in the, he said, you're always under attack. But you remember Daniel chapter 10 that we just read? Okay. And so what happens is, is that uh, Daniel was praying about something. The angel was given the answer. That's mysterious. Just like a homing pigeon or something. Here's the answer. Take it to that man. He's on his way and he's met by this. The scripture never tells us how many. But they had to be a lot because one angel has the ability to grab Satan by his hair, the Bible says, and place him in hell. So this is a huge army. It's a blockade created so that this angel cannot get to that person back there to give them the answer that does not even apply to them. That is just that is the thing you got to understand about warfare. It is intense. There's something the Holy Ghost told me this morning when I was shaving. He said, always know, son, that the devil is never at 99 percent. He and his crew stay on 100. At all times, they are always at 100, not 99, not 95, not 99.5, not 99.9. He and his crew are always at 100 percent. <clears throat> so, same way the angel blockade tried to stop him, he got through. Flip it. Now watch this. Okay? <laughs> the dark army decides to come for us. And so God then sends a blockade to prevent them from getting to us. But as you always watch warfare in Scripture, some get through and some don't. So some of the craziness that begin to happen, and some of y'all know about some of the lighter things, people just flipping out on us and all of that, okay? That was lighter stuff. Some of the deeper stuff was what I just prayed about with this young lady that I can't tell you. But people were getting hit. Some people were getting hit with fear. Some people were getting hit with depression. Some people were getting hit by suicide. Some people were getting hit with pain in their body that showed up. So, see, oh God, see, that's what I get for trying to rush. How many of you know, and I shared this with the staff, if you take everybody on the front row that's in the military and they all have, there are many different type of weapons, but if all of them have what you call assault rifles, number one, all of them have what you call a backup sidearm, which is the little small pistol, in case all your ammunition is gone, you can at least pull that out, okay? But just in the category of rifles alone, you remember, 
God always says, put on your armor to stop the attacks from the enemy. What type of weapons is he using? So, so she might have what you call a small arms assault rifle. Okay? It's, 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 an, it's an assault rifle you hold like this, but it's a little, it's a little bit lighter. And it's a semi, which semi-auto, which means you gotta, you got to pull the trigger each time to make the bullets come out. I prefer that type of style of weapon versus you just hold it down. Boom, 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 boom. Okay, you have that. Then you have larger arms. These are higher caliber weapons sometimes that have larger bullets. But it might be, so, so like that assault rifle might hold 30 rounds or 30 bullets. That bigger one might hold 100 bullets. And it shoots faster, and it can raise you down. Y'all follow me so far? Then you have assault rifles that have certain scopes. It can see heat signature, okay, <laughs> in case you're hiding in the dark. Then you have the most dangerous ones, which are sniper rifles. The snipers, you don't know where they're coming from because they're hiding and shooting at you from a distance. So they're not in the midst of the battle. They stay back and shoot, but you still get hit. And when you get hit, you don't know where it's coming from. The same way stuff start happening in your life, and you're like, where in the world is this foolishness coming from? What did I do? You're dealing with a demonic sniper. And with, with a sniper, you, you got to first figure out what direction is it coming from. We think it's coming from that tree line over there. So now they got to hide, and they got to stare to see if they see any movement. When you use a, a, a sniper rifle, it has a scope on it. So if the sun is out, if he adjusts it, you'll see a flash. And it says, see that flash? That's where he is. You still can't see him. You only locate him because of the flash. That's how you got to locate the enemy in your life. You got to be careful. And you got to ask the Holy Spirit, where is he? Amen. Y'all following me? Amen. Okay, so that's just an example of some of the rifle weapons that they use. So when it, now let's switch this back to the war. So when the enemy comes against us, they're not using the conventional bullets. They're using bullets called fear, strife, pride, anger, depression, sickness, disease. The Bible says that those that live in the world are taken captive by Satan at his will. Strife on the job. Why they hate me? I'm not doing anything. Y'all can listen to any type of foul music up here, but the moment I turn on a nice worship song, all of a sudden now, I'm out of order. So, all, so now watch this. First, there are scouts that come and say, before the major attack, let's see who is weak in what area. And they always go for the prideful one first. Because when this starts going on, when the pastor starts trying to correct, the prideful ones are not going to want to hear. So this is going to bring anguish. You have no idea what I've been dealing with. I came home one time, and, and let me tell you something. My wife, tell, my wife will tell you, and people close to me tell you, it take a whole lot for me to snap. I really only slapped two times in my life. One was I was in Bible school, and, and I didn't like that Bible school. I only went because the Lord was leading me to go. And I didn't like the school. They had novices teaching in the school. I wasn't learning nothing in the school. And one day, they, I was taking a class that I already wasn't good at, and we had a test. And I looked, I don't know if any of you have ever done this. I looked at the test. And I looked at the teacher. Everybody's taking the test. I looked at the test, sat it down, started packing my belongings. <laughs> she thought I was done early. I walked right up to here. Here you go. You can take this. She said, uh, but you don't have anything right. I said, I don't care. I'm done. I'm going home. I was done. I don't even know why I'm sharing this with y'all. I forgot the example that it was. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, snap. <laughs> that was a light snap. The other snap, of course, you know the story is when I, you know, almost brought the whole neighborhood, neighborhood down killing that pit bull. I felt myself snapping. Felt it last week. I just, because, see, you can hear me have to address something over the pulpit. Anything I address, I'm dealing with 100 more. Just the thing with this that just happened, that's a lot. So, so, and it's all the enemy now, concentrate. You ever see in a war, they, they'll say, concentrate your firepower over there. And so you got everything hit me, boom, boom, boom. People won't leave me alone during the fast. Every time we do a fast, my phone calls go up about 
I'm not saying this to anybody sent me. People sending me videos, people sending me prophecies, people sending me suggestions, people will send me stuff. I don't even know what this says. Stop speaking in tongues on the text. People just sending me stuff. And it's all meant to try to break me and make me do or say something stupid that I regret for the rest of my life. And I could feel it. And man, that thing was on me so hard one day. And y'all, I was at a point where, Lord, if I could only get home, if I could only get, it was that bad. And it was a full attack on the church to try to stop this moment. It was ordained to stop here. That's the reason why you, with me, my acceptance, me apologizing to the congregations, the, the services that you've seen, these last couple of services where the anointing came down strong and what happened, you had to be there Sunday to see what happened on Sunday. <laughs> and the orchestration of, I mean, all of those things, it was a war. And then after the Holy Spirit told me, he said it was a full-scale war against your entire ministry. And it was meant, he said, and everybody heard wrong. Everybody heard things that were wrong. Everybody, especially you. I have to wait. Sometimes I get on your last nerves because I won't do something. It's because, yeah, I said I was going to do this over here, but there are five other things that I got to wait on so that it doesn't destroy what I want to do over here. Sometimes I will say, Lord, I'm getting ready to do such and such such. Should I use this person or this couple? He won't answer me. Next week, they'll act a complete fool on me. Thank you for the answer. You have no idea how you can act a fool on somebody and walk away from your destiny. You have no idea. Because when you get close to it is when Satan steps in front of you. I know that you have been working all this time to go through this door. And you got really, really close to the door. You've been faithful and you've been doing what has been told and you've been humbling yourself. And now, right before you open this door, are you interested in this one instead? Peter got right up to Jesus, right up to him. He was already walking in the storm. He was already walking in the storm. Got right up to Peter and then looked at the storm. And the storm had nothing to do with his ability to walk on water. Not a thing. So there was a full-scale war because of what we are getting ready to do now. A full-scale war because we got to at least try to get Otha to do something that will make the whole thing break. It was a high-level, high-level attack against my mind. Against, I could feel it in my body and scenario after scenario after scenario. My wife was like, are you okay? I said, I'm just walking through it, scenario after scenario. And then the Holy Spirit said something to me. He said, but it has now come to a close. The victory is won. So that's why you see this change now. You see this. And, and, and when I tell you, the Lord showed me something. He said, I can't even show you what it looks like. But I'm going to show you a small version of it. And the small version freaked me out. The small version freaked me out. I wouldn't even want to be a part of that from a distance. But again, I want you all to remember something. How many of you believe in the natural sense that a message that is supposed to be given to you that applies 2,000 years in the future is of pretty much non-significance? Somebody told me, hey, man, I want to give you a revelation about something that's going to happen in 3,000 years. Keep that. I don't need to hear that. Understand what I'm saying? What is it about that realm? What is it about our purpose? What is it about even what we consider mundane, simple, and small that our army will create wars over it? Now, if that was a war over a word, what is the war over your soul? What is the war over your destiny? What is the war over this church? You have no idea how big the war is over this church because we just simply do the word and won't break. Don't be moved by people who fall by the wayside. Some will fall by the wayside and they'll come back. Others will fall by the wayside and the Lord will send them another route. Others will fall by the wayside, they will immediately go into the wilderness and stay there. Three million people did it. So don't get upset if one or two do. Holy Spirit told me something. He said, <laughs> you know how he's always rebuking me? He's, you know, because I'm always like, you know, I really did... I'm sorry. I just really did think that if I was just the best, nice, cozy, preach the truth and love the people and don't control them, that everybody would act right. I just really believe that. And that was the stupidest thing I could have ever believed. In the words of the Holy Spirit, 
your heavenly father is perfect. And the rebellion that came against his kingdom was so big, one out of every three angels kept Satan suggesting that all of a sudden perfection was not good enough. One out of three. Who are you? You better than God now, huh? You somehow have the ability to pastor people better than God. You have somehow the ability to love them better than God. Son, please, if the perfect one couldn't do it, who are you? You understand what I'm saying? This is the Lord warning me about things to come. And so we start pulling these triggers. We start pulling these triggers. We grew, we grew more in social media in three weeks than we have in about 10 years. 10. It's a mold method to this madness now, y'all. So, okay, good. So that was the bigger part. Eric and I are just going to do one passage of scripture, just one, and show y'all some things to consider as we move forward. I don't know what y'all laughing about. Be quiet. But let me say something. I'm going to make this clear. As you know, I'm not a control freak. Anybody can choose. You know, there are people that accuse me of being a control freak. Yeah, whatever. You are always going to be accused of things you are not when you follow God. People call you a control freak because you won't let them act a fool. No, I'm not a control freak. You just, anyway. We're going to be supporting you because we're moving out now. It's something that all of you need to settle in your heart right now. There is nobody in planet Earth that God calls to watch for your soul except pastors. No one else. That's scripture. Pastors are called to watch for your soul. So it might behoove you to understand that if I am called to watch for your soul, I have greater abilities than you in order to watch. I did not say greater gifting. I did not say greater power. I did not say greater wisdom, greater revelation of the scripture. Devil Moses not Bible more than you do, so hush. I'm saying that there is one category that no one can compete with me in, even though we know it's not a competition. And that is the Lord is always going to give me special abilities because I am called to watch for your soul. I have to answer for your soul. So keep in mind that because I have to watch for your soul, if I tell you you are wrong about something, guess what you should do? As long as I can show you in the word. Now, if it's my opinion, and eh, we got another thing to discuss. Y'all understand what I'm saying? But if I show you in the word, I don't talk to people without showing them scripture and showing them the word. And a lot of times people don't accept that. Because where we're going, you're going to destroy yourself. Because some of y'all are going to be used greatly with house churches and, and ministries and different types of ministries and, and going out. And, you know, if I tell you, you, stop, stop. If I tell you, slow down, slow down. There was a young lady. She didn't quite listen to the leadership. And she just jumped out there. doing. And all he did was say, take somebody with you. All right. You know, how, man, how come? I don't know you. Sometimes your husband, your, your, your wives, they're like, I got this. No. I didn't ask you if you got this. I said, don't go to Walmart after 8 p.m. I can handle myself. And how do you know this? You had a vision. You had a vision of the robber that was going to stab you in the neck as he took your groceries or something. She jumped out there. Come back. <laughs> What's wrong? Every time I go speak, the pastor's trying to sleep with me. That's why we told you to take someone with you. I got this. No, you don't. You don't have anything that you've never experienced or seen before. You understand me? So keep that in mind. All righty. Let me make sure I. <laughs> okay, so there are a lot of things that are coming. You know, we're, my wife and I are fully moving over into social media. Um, part of the midweek service being canceled and doing once a month, and it may not even be once a month in a minute. We'll see. I'm going to probably try to keep that, do once a month here. While I am now fully getting ready to, re to, to, to build the Riverdale location. I can do that now. So social media, my wife and I are going to be doing podcast, video podcast. We're going to have a Bible school, house church, all of those different type of things. The Bible school is going to be actually probably open to the public because I'm not interested in creating something for this church. I'm interested in creating something for the kingdom. I'm going to try to raise up the quickest and baddest army that the world has ever seen. Okay, Y'all got that? So again, you know, you uh, so just realize I'm doing something. I'm on new ground now. And new ground causes you to work faster 
but more carefully. So if I tell you, wait a minute, just a second, wait a minute, just a second. Don't just jump out there. I know how to cross straight. And the bus hits you. You're going to have to settle in your mind that I am for you and not against you. Because when I tell you they're getting ready to come after me in every single direction, they're going to come after me. But, as you know, it doesn't matter. As long as I stay in the word. Y'all got me? All right, Eric, you can come forward. Let's do this last part right quick. Hallelujah. Thank you, sir. Now I can drink some water. <laughs> All right. I grew up in the uh, AME church, and uh, one of the churches I went to, they had a very charismatic uh, preacher, the very, very large church. And so one of the uh, assistant ministers really didn't, all the assistant ministers didn't really get a chance to speak and didn't have, get a chance to teach, but they would, um, there would be a segment of the, of the uh, service where they could pray. And so every, every week was a different sermon or a different prayer by a different person. But um, this one particular minister on the staff, we nicknamed him um, Liver and Onions <laughs> because he prayed old school. It was like an old school meal. We called him Liver and Onions. But Liver and Onions would would pray for like 20 minutes. The, the prayer would be the sermon that he didn't get to preach. So, <laughs> so I'm hoping that y'all don't call me liver and onions. Let's go to Luke chapter four. <laughs> Luke chapter four. <clears throat> We're gonna talk about reframing temptation. We can go to that next slide and get right into it. All right. Then Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan River. He was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where he was tempted by the devil for 40 days. Jesus ate nothing all the time and became very hungry. And the devil said to him, if you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become a loaf of bread. But Jesus told him, no, the scriptures say people do not live by bread alone. Then the devil took him up and revealed to him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. I will give you the glory of these kingdoms and authority over them, the devil said, because they are mine to give to anyone I please. I will give it all to you if you worship me. Jesus replied, the scriptures say you must worship the Lord, your God, and serve him only. Next slide. The devil took him to Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple, and said, if you are the son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say, he will order his angels to protect and guard you, and, you will, and they will hold you up with their hands, so you won't hurt your foot on a stone. Jesus responded, the scriptures also say, you must not test the Lord your God. When the devil had finished tempting Jesus, he left them until the next oppor opportunity came. Then Jesus returned to Galilee, filled with the Holy Spirit's power. Reports about him spread quickly through the whole region. So let's, I'm going to stop right there in Luke. Um, and let's break down something that I noticed as I was studying Luke earlier this week. So let's go to the next. Yes, there it is. The first part of that Scripture says that he was full of the Holy Spirit. While the last part of that, after the temptation, says he was filled with the Holy Spirit's power. So there's a difference there. So one can be full of the Holy Spirit, but not be full of the Holy Spirit's power. There's a difference. And so what happened from Jesus being filled with the Holy Spirit to being filled with his power. There was a transition that took place. And so when we read this story, we see 
a formula, we see something that Jesus wants us to know about, but it's not spelled out. Remember, the Bible is like a puzzle, and it's our opportunity to put that puzzle together, right? So let's go to the next slide. So let's look at that first part of the verse. Full of the Holy Spirit. Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit, returned to the Jordan River. He was led by the Spirit into the wilderness where he was tempted of the devil for 40 days. So notice he was led by the Holy Spirit. So in this scenario, it wasn't the devil jumping out of the bushes and coming to attack him. The Holy Spirit led him into this situation. The question might be, how, did, how was Jesus full? How was he full? And so we know from other scriptures that we can build our spirit man up by praying in our heavenly prayer language. We also know that the word is described as being food. food. And so just like your physical body, the more food you eat, the more full you'll get. And so for us spiritually, the more we are in the scripture, the more full we'll be. So a hint when it says he was full of the spirit, he was full of that word. And so that's the same, remember, that Jesus is a prototype. He's the example of what we should be, right? So if he was full of the spirit, he's giving you a hint there. You can be full of the spirit too. We all should be full of the spirit. So we've been reiterating, reiterating, read your word, stay in the word. Why? because we need to be full, all right? And so he's full of the spirit. Um, and then I just had a side note there um, about social media, because as I was studying this, the, this just popped up in my mind. I was like, oh, that was the Holy Spirit right there. <laughs> and so direct quote, quote from the throne, social media has become such an idol that even Christians find little time to get full. Social media is the dumpster in which spiritually starving people rummage for food. All right. So as we as a ministry engage social media, that's not because we're rummaging for food. We're rummaging for the souls that are rummaging for food. We have the keys to the kingdom. And so we're trying to find and those people that are looking for those keys. All right? Okay, so Jesus was full of the Spirit, not full of social media. Looking to the back wall, like my pastor says, to my imaginary congregation. <laughs> All right, next slide. So let's compare that with the end part of the verse. When the devil had finished tempting Jesus, he left him until the next opportunity came. Then Jesus returned to Galilee filled with the Holy Spirit's power. Reports about him quickly, spread quickly through the whole region. So after the 40-day temptation and fasting period, because the first part said he refrained from food, and it was a temptation period. So he was going through a trial. He was going through temptation, and he fasted. So the two were there, and after that, he was filled with the Holy Spirit's power. So notice that that power is, is not mentioned until Jesus had defeated that temptation. Until he is overcome, that's when the power came. This is the key to our extraordinary feats and power that we are seeking, those miracles that we're seeking. So there's a formula there. The formula is temptation or trial and fasting equals power. So that's a spiritual equation right there, spiritual mathematics for you. All right, how do I exert, exert power to conquer my next enemy? How do I overcome a thing? You stand there. You're full of the spirit, first of all. You're not going to conquer if you're not full. So first of all, you need to be full 
prep prepared for whatever the devil comes or the enemy brings your way. And then if you're going through something, recognize it. Do what you need to do to step back so you can be empowered to overcome it. In Jesus' case, it was a 40-day fast. There was something that was sacrificed in order for him to get that power. All right? And then after that period of time, the devil's always on, right? So he's looking for the next opportunity, but he did have to go. There was a time lock on that temptation. There was a time lock on that trial. So every trial has a time, has a time lock. So if you just wait, you can get through it. Right? All right, so here we are. We have a formula. So um, the pastor teaches sometimes, that, and it's in the scripture, so it's, it's, it's sound. Half a dozen times in the scriptures it says, by two or three witnesses, let every word be established. So we showed you this example and this word already, right? We, we were there, all right? But then the Bible's a puzzle. Are there other pieces of the puzzle that relate to what we just said so that you're not just taking one scripture and trying to make a doctrine out of it? If I can see a thread, then I'm on safe ground biblically, okay? Let's look at Mark 29. So he said to them, this is the kind, this kind can only come out, come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. And so we saw Jesus encountering Satan himself. It was during a 40-day fast. It doesn't say he was praying. But the scripture here says this can only come out by fasting and prayer. So we can assume he was also in prayer during that fast. 40 days. We can make that safe assumption because Satan was expelled at the end, right? And so any lower demonic force, the same formula can work on them. Here it is. Fasting. Prayer. What are you giving up in order to have this victory? Next slide. All right. So here's a divine order. We need to be full. We have the word, that's a lifestyle. Let's be full, because that's going to precede being led. He was full before the Holy Spirit then led him. No leading. I mean, if you're not full, it's going to be hard to be led. The Holy Spirit's not going to lead you somewhere where he, where he knows you won't have the victory. Why would he lead you? But when you're full, you're prepared for victory. The Father is always trying to advance us. He is a conqueror. So if he's leading you somewhere, it's because he wants you to be his representative to conquer. So be full. Then you can be led. Once you're led, then it might lead to a testing. But the testing precedes power. And then power precedes exploits. So it is time for this church to walk in the exploits. We're at the end of a 21-day fast corporately. So what are the things that are going to pop off as a result of our faithfulness during this fasting time? There should be a high expectation. I just fasted. Something needs to break. Something needs to move on our behalf. Because there's a spiritual law. So question, next slide. If Jesus did not go through this 40-day temptation period, would he have been prepared for the final temptation before the cross? So we know at the end, he was tempted to say, take this cup away from me. What well, he said, mm -mm, not my will, your, your will be done. And thank God he did. But would he have made that decision had he not had some testing that he passed in his past? So there was something he had to do. It wasn't that we know Jesus was 100% God, 100% man. 
And sometimes we think the God part of that supersedes what we can do. Oh, that was Jesus. That's not us. But remember, Jesus is the prototype. Once we died, destroyed, and created anew, our spirit is one with Jesus, just like Jesus and the Father are one. So that same spirit is on the inside of us. And then Jesus walked in a physical body like we're walking in a physical body right now. So he's the prototype. He's the firstborn among many brethren, right? Right? So he's showing you, he's giving you the formula for your success. So let's go to the next one. What are the implications of this? Our temptations, our trials, and good stress, so we can do this on purpose to get power, builds strength. So overcoming these things requires discipline. So let's look at examples. So if you were to build strength as an athlete, there needs to be some type of resistance for you to build your muscles. If there's no resistance, there won't be a growth in your muscles. And so we need to make sure that if we want to be strong, that there's, there's a resistance, there's something that we have overcome to prove and show that we're strong. There needs to be something to develop us. Right? If you are an athlete or a player, let's say, or um, a world-class volleyball player, we know that the way you get better is against stiff competition. The more you go against the competitors, the more prepared you are to win. The more your skills are developed. Right? And so when we're looking at the trials that we're facing, that is an opportunity for us to develop our skills of overcoming the enemy. Next slide. Spiritually speaking, in order to grow in there must be resistance by which spiritual men have no trials in my life. If Jesus had to go through trials. So there has to be a trial. There has to be a trial. So, you know, living life and just, oh, everything's good. No strength. It's like going to the gym and just looking at the weights. Mm-mm. Got to lift them. Got to lift them. All right. So let's look at the next slide. So in Luke 4, Satan does not sneak up on Jesus to challenge him. Rather, the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tested. And so he was, this is the equivalent of the Holy Spirit leading Jesus to the gym. You need to get stronger. Let me lead you somewhere. You're about to start this ministry. Let me lead you so you can build some muscle before you start this ministry. He was led by the Spirit into this situation so he could be built up and handle what was coming. Now, if you read chapter, the rest of chapter 4, you'll see that his supernatural power was needed for what he faced. Soon after that, it was a whole mob that came after him and it said that Jesus just walked through them. How does he get to exploits like that? Because he was God or because he went through a trial and built up his strength to operate as a God? Next slide. We are the siblings of Jesus. He's our big brother. And so we might need to reframe our outlook on troubles that come in our life. Perhaps God is allowing us to be tested so that we can measure and then grow our spiritual strength. If you go through something and it, and it defeats you, that's an indication. That's a, that's a weighing scale. You've been weighed and found wanting. <laughs> but if you're able to endure it, that's going to build you up. And you'll say, oh, I can do that, then I can do the next thing. Perhaps our greatest challenges are actually our greatest opportunities. All right. 
And so um, the pastor just mentioned if sometimes to go to the next level, it's going to take an experience where you feel like you're going to die, right? And so that's definitely my testimony. Okay, I'll get it. All right, now, <laughs> real quick, first marriage that I was in, um, I was running amok because I got married before I rededicated myself in 2007. But in 2007, I made a vow to the Lord I would never run amok again. I would be very, very righteous when it came to the opposite sex. Very righteous. And so when that marriage ended, there was, a, there was a period of time where I was technically single, but I treated it like I was technically a monk. I had to sacrifice some things. I had to go on a physical fast. My eyes was on a fast. My ears was on a fast. Some of you have heard my testimony before. I would go to basketball games. The cheerleaders would come out, and I would boo. <laughs> I was serious about that thing. But as a result, I was tested. And so because I was determined to do it God's way, he brought me to the wife that I needed, and I got his choice for me not my own. So I had to be tested in order to get that because it was a good thing, but I had to go through a test to get it. All right, next slide. All right, so relate what we just talked about and going through that testing to this scripture. Remember, it's going to be, you'll see a thread in scripture. 1 Corinthians 9.27 but like a boxer, I strictly discipline my body to make it a slave so that after I have preached the gospel to others, my, I myself will not somehow be disqualified as unfit for service. And so we discipline ourselves. Fasting is a form of disciplining yourself. When you discipline yourself, when you're fasting, it's building up spiritual muscle. If I can go through the fast, if I, can, if I can fast from the thing that brings me life, food, then I can overcome anything that comes my way. Because what other desire or temptation is stronger than food? No. So if you can defeat that one, all the other ones are easier. Next scripture. 1 Corinthians. 10, 13, again, keeping in mind what we just said, a thread. Temptation in your life are no different from what others have experienced. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you the way out so that you are able to endure it. So no matter what temptation, trial, or problem you go through, you are engineered and designed to overcome it. The Holy Spirit will not lead you into it, or it won't be allowed unless you are, are able to overcome it. So all you have to do is not give up. Interestingly, you mentioned the chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, the whole chapter on love that we hear at all the weddings and everything. And in there it says, love never gives up. So when you're not giving up, it is an act of love. Next scripture, last scripture. Again, a thread, Romans 5, 3 through 5. We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials for we know that they help us develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character. In character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment. For we know how dearly God loves us because he was given to us by the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. So here it tells you how to reframe temptation. Rejoice when you run into those problems. Rejoice. 
He's found you worthy to grow you so you can overcome something. Final thoughts. So I'm teaching a class right now, um, Gifts of the Spirit, and one of my students pulled me aside or called me afterwards and had these prophetic words for me. And she is not a word person. And she's very new to the faith, but has a strong prophetic gifting. And so she said these things to me, and I thought it was kind of apropos what I was studying, and it kind of tied in. These are the last days of the sun. And so I heard uh, Priscilla, and I'm forgetting her last name. Um, there it is. All right. <laughs> Recently say that um, people sometimes look at age as far as how old they were, how long it was since they got born. And then they'd also determine it like, well, if I'm 20, then I got another 60, 70, 80 years to live, so I'm young, right? And they, they determine that because they're trying to map how long it's going to be before they actually die. And so the closer you are to death, the older you're considered. But in the spirit, we all old because we don't have much time left. You could be born yesterday, Benjamin Buttons. We old, y'all. There's not much time left. These are the last days of the sun. And so that first one, if you look at Revelation chapter 8, it ties directly to that. The draft is almost over. Many are called. Few are chosen. And that's not only just being saved, but who is God going to use? Because even all the people who are saved, he only uses a few. He's going to use those that are full of the Spirit. Those are the ones he's going to lead. Be ready. And so given that we have a short time, we need to be ready. Given that everyone goes through something, we need to be ready. We need to be full of the Spirit, ready to be led. And when he, wherever the Spirit leads you, know it's a place to strengthen you. Amen. Hallelujah. That was a great. You know, do me a favor and put up, go back a few slides when it says this precedes this, this precedes this. You need to remember that. Being full precedes being led. There are a lot of people that have not gone into certain battles because you weren't full in the first place. And then being led precedes being tested. And then testing precedes power. And power precedes exploits. Every time you're in class, they're only preparing you for a test. You know, and that's very powerful. You know, and I walked Eric through that process a little bit because he would call me. And, and, you know, when you're, trying, you're, when you're being tested, you have weak moments. And he would be on his job, and he's like, man, I'm single right now. And he said, I'm living holy. And he said, these females after me. <laughs> but let me tell you something. I'm just using them as an example, okay, because mo mo most of us, we miss opportunities because we move too slow to obey and humble. The reason why, the one main reason why Marquita's married to Eric, she followed every single last instruction my wife told her. To the T, without question, without fighting. Small, big, or extreme. She, do this, do this, do this, do this. Followed every instruction, boom. So you have to ask yourself, do you follow instructions like that? You don't get to the top of the mountain except for one thing, instructions. Not what you hear, not even what you do. But there's instructions. I learned that from all you folks. He said, it's the instructions that I'll follow that got me to this level of weight I am. You go to the gym. You ain't been there in 30 years. I know how to work out. Boom, boom. Then you hit yourself in the chin. <laughs> Y'all follow me? Don't be mad. Be glad. I have one scripture just to add to that. Because when you read the Bible, the disciples, one would get it this way and another one would get it this way. So I'm just going to read the last scripture. And this is Matthew's account of the same story. Matthew 4.1, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. For 40 days and 40 nights he fasted and became very hungry. Right? 
During that time, the devil came and said to him, if you are the son of God, tell these stories or these stones to become loaves of bread. Jesus told him, no, the scriptures say people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city, Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say he will order his angels to protect you and they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even have to hurt your foot on a stone. Jesus responded, the scriptures also say you must not test the Lord your God. Next, the devil took him to the peak of the very high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Showed him all the, took him to the peak of a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. I will give it all to you, he said, if you'll kneel down and worship me. Get out of here, Satan, Jesus told him. For the scriptures say, you must worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil went away. And this is the part that's added that Luke 4 didn't. And the angels came and took care of Jesus. There's amazing things that are on the other side of obedience and overcoming temptation, test, and trial. And that temptation, test, and trial is sometimes God is sending you through a scenario to see will you overcome yourself. You understand what I'm saying? So just the thing I want you to remember is he was attacked for 40 days straight. The Bible only records three of the temptations out of the 40. You go back to Luke chapter 4, verse 1, it says he was tempted for the entire 40 days all day. The three are insane enough. What were the other ones for all 40 days all day? Okay? But here's the one thing that all of you need to remember with where we're going. Notice that Jesus' only defense was the word of God. Not his feelings. Not what he saw. Not what he heard. Not what his mama told him. Not what his pastor told him. Nothing. He didn't probably have a pastor, but he did have religious rulers that he was under. <laughs> he had religious guys that he was under, and he submitted himself to them. The boy was arguing with them at 12. Walked away from his mom and daddy. That's, you never saw Joseph again when Jesus made this statement. Don't you know I must be about my father's business? Joseph looked at Mary. First of all, I didn't even sign up for this. The fact that you got pregnant by something called the Holy Ghost is beyond me. I have bared the shame of you having all of this type of stuff, thinking that you cheated or I did something. <clears throat> all of this. And now this boy sitting up here, after he walked away from us for three days, you're not my daddy. That's crazy. You never heard from Joseph after that, did you? Okay. So, not only... Um, not once did either one of the passages say anything about certain things. It was his ability to overcome the psychological attacks of the devil. The word is the more sure word of prophecy. <clears throat> no matter what Jesus was hit with, the word was his answer. Most people don't obey the word when hit with certain things. They obey their feelings. Y'all got me? So let me say something. This is just very... Oh. Last scripture, and then I'll make my final point when we're done. Matthew 16, 21. Because this is all of us. The only way that I should say is two major things that I've been able to do that allows me to not make too many mistakes, and that is whatever I feel and whatever I hear, I don't believe it unless it's good. I wait and then I submit my feelings and my thoughts to the word regardless of what my eyes tell me. If I didn't do that, I would have destroyed a lot of people because the devil is always lying to me about people. Lying, lying, lying to me about people. So you think sometimes I have to address things because of Satan lied to people about there, out there to me. You have no idea. Think about that. When, when, when he is lying to you about me, he's lying to you about one person. What happens when he's lying to me about 100? Matthew 16, 21, from then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem. He would suffer many terrible things at the hands of the elders, the leading priest and the teachers of religious law. He would be killed, but on the third day, he would be raised from the dead. But Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him for saying such things. Remember, be careful who takes you aside. And he began to reprimand him for saying such things. Heaven forbid, Lord, 
spiritual language. This will never happen to you. Jesus turned to Peter and said, get away from me, Satan. Listen to what he said. You are a dangerous trap for the Son of God. He didn't call him a lightweight. He said, you are a dangerous trap for me, boy. You trying to pull me or something. You dangerous. You are a dangerous trap for me. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view and not God's. So this last statement that I have for you, and then we can all go and enjoy the rest of the day. I just feel like chilling out today, you know. I'm just, you know what? I've been through a great battle, so that's why I feel like this. I'm just ready to go eat something crazy. And, and let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. It is so important for you to do your part. It's so important. I can't, I can't remember to recognize everybody. I can't remember to celebrate everybody's birthday. It's so important for you to do your part because you want to hear something? The Lord said we made it through the battle, not because of me, but because of y'all. I'm telling you. See, there's some people. See, quit worrying about during the fast. There are some people, they couldn't stop. They just had to eat something. But the other days you were fasting. We casted a demon out of somebody, and you know what the demon told me? He said, the only reason why I have to come out faster is because the girl didn't even eat breakfast this morning. Just her skipping breakfast, and she was the one that had the demon. Just by her skipping breakfast, he said it made her stronger, and now you can move faster. Quit, look at what you were able to add. Not what you didn't add. You know what I'm saying? Now, some of us, we lazy and, and we trifling and, 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 we, and we, you know, we just do the minimum. But at least you're doing something. So look at yourself and say, I need to do more. But quit letting the devil uh, be, beat you up because of what you couldn't do. You know, you know, I was fasting for three days and then I just had to eat something. Well, you did something for three days. It's not some type of competition. It is empowerment. But I'm telling you. Lord made that clear. If you didn't have a, if you didn't have a praying church, you wouldn't have got through that battle. You wouldn't have got through that battle. Y'all have no idea the level that is against this little small lion. I'm talking about me. I'm talking about the church. You have no idea. We have found ourselves almost 100% in the word when it comes to doing ministry. And they are after us. And the Lord made it clear. He said, oh, trust me, it's another one coming. That same scenario. Relentless. It's another one coming. And so, but... You have to be full just to be able to go into the test. And so there, this is going to sound so strange. There are many tests that some of us have not gone through only because you're not full enough to overcome it. And if you can overcome the test, then you're given power because that is a crazy scripture because he brought out the fasting and prayer. But what's crazy about it is Luke, we're wondering, I'm sure Jesus was praying, but the scripture in Luke 4 and Matthew, Matthew 4, it didn't bring that out. It's, and this is the crazy thing. It said that when he was full, it said the Holy Spirit took him to the gym in the wilderness so he could, he could be tested, so that the devil could attack him. Because in order for you to walk in power, the formula is you got to overcome test, not pray another 40 days. And the churches that we came from, they ran away from everything that was negative. If you got sick, it was something wrong with you. You know what I'm saying? What? It was, it was always the question, what open door do you have? The front door. That's how I get in my house. That's the only door that's open in my life. Well, I always got to be an open door for the devil. The devil does not attack people based on open doors. He attacks people because they're connected to Christ. And God allows it so you can have strength to beat him in another battle that's bigger than this one. And we've been taught to run from temptation. Feel ashamed because I'm going through something. That is not biblical. It's just not. So the thing that I have for you, you all, is this we have all failed in this area some more than others I don't fail a lot in this area but I do fail Jesus and Satan Jesus is hit with Satan for 40 days straight all day these thoughts come to his mind and for 40 days straight all day Jesus only did one thing he only did and spoke the word And so the thing is, is that you are under more attacks than you would ever imagine. But what's going on is, is that you're not speaking the word. You understand what I'm saying? In these last 21 days, what have you said wrong that came to mind? 
What have you acted on that came to mind? And I frustrate a lot of people. You know why? I don't care about anything except for the more sure word of prophecy. The only reason why this ministry is where it is and going where it is is because of one thing. You are never in a million years going to convince me to break any part of the word. I can be wrong about stuff. Told my wife just a couple days ago, I was telling her the story about Paul. How that, I said, you know, that little 12-year-old girl detached you know, herself to Paul, he didn't know she had a demon because she was saying the truth out of her mouth. You got to wait on stuff like that. These are the servants of the Most High come to show us how to get saved. That was an absolute statement of truth, but she, it was a demon that was speaking it. Just because it was true doesn't mean it is true. You know what I'm saying? Just because it's a statement of truth doesn't mean it came from a true person. You know, guess what my wife said? Are you sure she was 12? Absolutely. She was 12. I don't know. I said, yes, she was. She was 12. So right there in front of my wife, I looked it up. Don't say nothing about this girl was 12. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Did that mean I was a bad person because I was wrong? No, it just meant that I forgot something. And let me tell you something. God will use you to the, uh, to the degree that you will die to self. When you lose your reputation, when you use, when you lose the fact that I got to be right about stuff and you lose that guy I was listening to, he gave the example of the Snicker bar. He said, if you were living in your favorite candy bar with Snickers, he said, it doesn't matter when you're in a casket and they set it right underneath your chin. Because you're dead. And Jesus said, he said, be a living sacrifice. In the Old Testament, you killed the sacrifice for God. What he said was, I need you to kill yourself, but still live. And if you can do that, you'll smell real sweet to God, and he's going to bless you greatly. Because where we're going, it's no longer about these four walls. We are the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. And Jesus is the head. And this is a building that the body meets in. That's why Jesus said, with two or three years, there I am. The whole body meets together to discuss what we're supposed to do out there. We are part of a kingdom that is at war in this dimension. And it's a glorious war. It's so crazy. I have to be careful what I say about my wife because she's like, well, I don't, I don't share your feelings about this matter. But it's just, ever since the Holy Spirit started telling me to live my life from the place of an eternal king, I enjoy war. I look forward to it. I enjoy the pressure. I, I actually enjoy the fact that Satan almost got me and he didn't. It's, it's weird. When you study kings, they would just go to war for no reason at all because they just like fighting. It's a kingdom. Everything is about kingdoms that are clashing. Satan against other kingdoms, I mean, us against them, the angels helping us and Satan helping his people and empower. Everything is about fighting. When you read the Bible, you do realize that the whole theme is nothing but warfare. Everybody fighting, everybody killing, everybody destroying, even Israel and Judah. Israel and Judah were the same people that separated themselves in the two camps, and they were at, more, at war with each other more than they were at the enemy. It's nothing but war, war, war against each other. Jesus said in the last days, the races will be against each other. It's just war after war, everything that is spilling over into this realm because of the greatest one that's going on in the theater of outer space. So I'm just encouraging you, practice, and it's going to be harder for some of you, but for you all that it's hard for, you'll walk in real great power. Anything that's hard is going to produce. How many know when you're at the gym? I'm, I'm, I'm done. When you're at the gym, how many know? When you go to the gym, you don't hear orchestra music. You go to the gym, you don't hear soft voices, except for this old new little gym. What is it, little raggedy gym? Yeah, or they... It's a woke gym. This I'm not gonna say it out loud in case they try to sue me. But you know where? What is their theme? Um, the no judgment zone. No, you need to be judged when you go to the gym. You need to be judged. They crack me up with all of this wokeness stuff. But at the tip, you go to the right gym, and you and you're gonna hear thud and rah. You're gonna hear all of that, and you're gonna hear somebody getting cussed out by a trainer. You're gonna hear somebody at a real gym, not these new little punk gyms, these little woke gyms that want to make it seem like you know everything is nice and cozy. And and the gym we used to be a part of, if you drop the weight on the on the ground too hard, rah. 
ah, you're here all along because they didn't want you dropping weights. But you go to them other gyms, you walk in, mm -mm, this look like this is right here, a military exercise right here. I don't want no part of this. That dude is lifting a, a, a big old weight with his neck with a chain around it that's rusty. Mm -mm, this ain't the place for me, but at a real gym. Why? And the gym is for one scenario, to get your behind in shape. And getting in shape is gruesome. It's ugly. That trainer stand over you. Two more. I can't do no more. Yes, you can. I'm Obama right now. Yes, you can. I think that was him. <laughs> I didn't vote for him, so I didn't know. Okay. But anyway, that's another story. Okay. I just exposed myself, didn't I? Don't care. Okay. I liked the man. I just didn't think he would be a good president. So I don't vote race. I vote. Y'all know what I'm saying, but let's get back to the gym. But, but it's pain in the gym. You leave that gym, you sore. You know, some of y'all go home, got to have an Epsom bath. You're at home stretching. And, oh, you ever, you ever went to the gym and you woke up in the middle of the night with a cramp? That's all of the pain. But if you will continue going through that pain, guess what? Many people will begin to envy you. Man, I need to get in shape like you. Yeah, well, it's pain. Remember that time? That's where I closed. My, we did a funeral together, and there was a first lady and her husband there, and they were pastors. And so my wife and I, I had said something in the podium. I only did it one time, see? This is the only time I have done it. I'm getting delivered with my new assignment. This is for everybody. I'm, see, this is for everybody. And, and so after service, she came up to my wife. Hey, you had great testimony, you know. And girl, you have six kids? And I was like, well, yeah. She said, ooh, you're anointed. No, my wife said the, the name of the anointing is called the gym. <laughs> she went in on my wife. No, girl, you don't do And And cause I might, you might have mentioned something about, you know, because I do this with my husband. She said, no, girl. Mm -mm. Your husband need to recognize that you, that you didn't have these six kids. And my wife said, no matter if I had 50 kids. My husband still likes to see me a particular way. So he makes it allowance for me to go work out. No, girl, he need to understand. You know, we sacrifice and pop out these babies. Wonderful. It's a wonderful sacrifice. Mm -hmm. They got nothing to do with what he likes. She kept on fighting my wife, fighting my wife. And when my wife would not break, you're right, my husband trying to get me to go to the gym for a <laughs> See, what was going on? See, I know what I should do, but I need to tear down your victory to make myself look good. And that's what people do. Y'all, everybody in here can do something that somebody else can't do. My wife just said something today on the, on the way out. She says, I'm about to turn this over to the lady at the church. She said, because I can do it, but it's going to take me about 500 years to finish it. Everybody can do something. We are called to celebrate each other with our individual gifts because in a minute, all of us will have them all. It's humility, sacrifice. Can you celebrate somebody because they know how to dress? And you keep leaving the house in shorts with ashy legs and flip-flops? <laughs> okay, that's not, let me tell you something. My wife dresses well. So I'm not throwing shade at my wife when I talk about how Kim Prude come over here like she come from a modeling contest every single time. <laughs> There's some people, they, they know how to just put stuff together faster than you and quicker than you. Her and her mama, look at her mama sitting back there like she just came from Russia with a fur coat on looking like a queen. Like, look at this. Foolishness right here. That ain't got nothing to do with my wife. What's your chance? Your, your wife can't dress? No, my wife dresses and she dresses very, very well. Me trying to celebrate something else. Y'all understand what I'm saying? Celebrate other individuals. There are some of us, we're going to always come to church with jeans and a baseball hat on. And then there's some people, they, some men, they know how to put together wardrobes and stuff. I need, I need to change my wardrobe, but I need help. Because I'm trying to go back a few years and kind of blend in with the younger people, and I might mess that up. <laughs> Look at Pastor here with some pink pants on, on a yellow T-shirt with a bass bat on the back. You know, good and well, that is not your style. Who told you to do that? I met a 16-year-old at the store, and they helped me. Well, you need to go on and help yourself because you look crazy. You understand what I'm Everybody can do something well. Some of us can speak very well. And some of us murder the English language. 
there are some people that it's like they just stay fit. They just look like they've been hanging out with Arnold Schwarzenegger for the last 30 years and celebrate that because it's an encouragement. You understand what I'm saying? I can't stand running. Renee runs marathon. So I ain't going to never practice with her. I was just watching with Renee. There goes Renee again. She just did another lap. Give him praise and glory, Father. I want to celebrate that she is showing us how to endure in the name of Jesus and all of the battles that come from giving up during the marathon. I'm not going out there. If she fall down there, I'll give her a cup of water because you said if you give a sister a cup of water, you have not looked. That's me. I'm not running nowhere. But I can ride a bike 30 miles without blinking. I can ride about 17 miles in an hour. But if I take you out there with you, you're like, no, no, no. I'm going to sit here and eat this hamburger while you go. <laughs> Y'all understand what I'm saying? And if we can just realize that in a minute, we're all going to be everything. And right now, God is just teaching us how to humble ourselves and respect one another and not feel bad because somebody has it better in another area than you do. You go to somebody's house, and they got a $500,000 house, and you in an apartment. So both of y'all houses and your apartments is trash compared to the mansions you're going to get on the other side. Time. Can you just die to all of this foolishness during time? Because in a minute, you're going to live forever with everything that you ever wanted. Y'all got me? Practice that because it's getting very toxic out here. And the things that are getting ready to happen now, they're the... The dark side is going to try to use hallucination on this church. Hallucination is very something very difficult to deal with. You can only deal with it if you go according to the word and wait. Because you'll look at the word, I accept that, but why is the hallucination still there? You got to be very careful because, you know, everybody wants that church revival. And we're going here and we're going to kick the devil in his teeth and we're going to do all of this type of stuff. But you don't understand the sacrifice that you have to pay and the discipline that you have to have. How many of you know? How many of you have ran a mile or less in your lifetime? Would you agree? Would you agree that you can run? Go out there with Renee and see what happens. <laughs> hey, Renee, I heard you do marathons. Mm -hmm. Girl, let's go running together. Renee's going to say, I, I don't think that's a good idea for you to go running with me. You think you're better than me? No. I'm more trained than you are, and I don't want you to hurt yourself. Now, you can do what I do, but you're going to have to follow my instructions. Devon tricked us like that at our previous church. <laughs> I'm just, don't, these are my closing comments for the day. Now, we'll forget when Devon did this at the previous church. He came with the idea. Now, Devon is a runner. Like Renee, he likes to run. I don't like to run. He invites all of the brothers at the church, hey, let's go running together at the sweet water place, the, the, the four-mile forest. This brother takes us out there. Y'all ready? Mm-hmm. He takes off. And so we run it behind him, and it's trees, it's stumps out there, it's animals out there. And y'all, we are literally running behind this man like we are dying. <laughs> and all he does is just look back, and we are just like, man. <laughs> and I'm just like, see. But you got to appreciate people that sometimes show you an area that you might need to come up with. You know what I'm saying? So I'm just saying, in order for us to move forward, we're going to all have to be together. And remember this. Any, from now on, if someone tells you something about me that's negative, either throw it in the trash or just say, hey. You don't have to tell me who the person is. Say, hey, this is what I heard. Because some people believe that crap. They believe it. This is what I heard. And... I'm just wanting to know, I need to settle. Is this really true? And I will tell you, no, that's not true. This is the other side of the story. And I want to attack people because the enemy always looks in the herd to see who is the weakest to run their mouth. He just does. And he can be very convincing because if you know, there's pretty much not a member. I got 17 staff members at this location. The cool thing is, is that with the other ones that's now at the new location, I can tell them about some things so that they don't fall in the same trap. But out of all of the staff members, there's pretty 90% of them, the enemy has told me negative things about them that weren't true. Imagine if I act on it. I don't go according to what's up here. But walk in love, be patient, long-suffering, be sober, watch. 
And every time I was wrong. Not sometimes, every time I was wrong. Every time. I just don't tell them that. They're like, really? Mm -hmm. You'd be surprised. You'd be surprised how many, how many times Satan tell me they're going to uprise. You know what I have to say? So, I ain't got no one move. They decided to uprise. He was lying. He was just lying. And with where we're going, if we're going to be used by God greatly, you're going to have to learn how to deal with the lie that's in your head. We must stop them. And the first rule is try to get them to turn on each other. There are some things that I could have done, y'all, and this church would have imploded if I acted on what I thought. I'm telling you, and I had to ask God, Lord, it's been a couple things. I said, Lord, you're going to have to guide me through this because I'm getting hit by about 25, 30 different directions. 25, 30. And they're all different. You're going to have to help me. And the Lord will give a dream. He'll, he'll, he'll give me clarity on something. Y'all understand what I'm saying? So, hallelujah. Let's go ahead and stand. Yeah. Hit this quick, yeah. Good morning. Um, this word is for the teens and the youth. Um, while Eric was preaching, actually it came up when Pastor O talked about Jesus being 12 when he was going back and forth with the religious leaders. The Lord wants the teens and the youth to know that you are not immune to what was preached about today. It is not just a war against the adults. It's a war against you. And dare I say, the war is even more difficult for you. And so what the Lord wants you to know is, one, that you are significant, that you matter much more than you know. And so the temptations and the trials, they will come to you. But you have to know what to do to stand. And so the word of God is effective for you like it is for your parents. You have to get into the word. You cannot stand on the righteousness of your parents because at the end of your life, you are going to stand before God. So the Lord is calling you. He told me that he's calling you to go faster, higher, and deeper than your parents have yet. Faster, higher, and deeper. Faster, higher, and deeper. So you have to get into the word. You have to get into prayer. You have to begin to fast. Each word that was preached today is applicable to you. You have to take your spiritual life seriously because the devil is after you and your destiny and your calling. He is after you because you are the ones that is going to fight a fierce battle against the kingdom of darkness. It's the youth. He wants your soul. He wants your destiny. He wants your focus. He wants you to be on social media all the time. He wants you to be on TikTok. He wants you to learn from people that are not righteous. He wants you to despise the things of God. He wants you to look at your parents like they lame. He wants you to do those things to keep you from who you truly are. But let me tell you something. You are children of the Most High God. You are children of the kingdom, made of men who never die. So you best start doing what you know you are supposed to do. Get in that word. Take your spiritual life seriously. You are not children to the devil. You are kings and priests, and you are more than conquerors, and he knows that you are the ones that are supposed to conquer him. So I call on you. I charge you. Conquer him. Defeat the enemy. Every trial and every temptation, you have the tools that you need. And if you need help, you have people around you that can help you. But rest assured, he's coming for you just as hard as he's coming for us, if not harder. You are children of the kingdom of God. Remember it. Stay sober. Stay vigilant because you matter. You're important. And the battle 
is just beginning. Amen. And amen. Let's lift our hands and give God thanks. It's one of the reasons for our removal of the Wednesday service is for the establishment of others. One of those things will be for the youth to let them begin to do the work of the ministry and do all of these things. That was a very powerful statement. Satan does not see them as children. He sees them as spirits. It's amazing. Father, in Jesus' name, we lift our hands and give you thanks and praise. We give you glory and honor, O Lord God, and give you thanks. For you are good. Thank you, O Lord God, for making us all one. Whether here, Riverdale, online, and other countries that are joining us, make us all one, O Father God. Make us, O Lord God, into one, an enemy, a weapon that the enemy has never seen before. Thank you, O Lord God, for these deposits that have been made. Help us, O Lord God, to practice and be a doer of the word so that we do not deceive ourselves. Thank you, O Father God. Thank you, O Lord God, for chastising us. You only do it for those that you love. Help us, O Lord God, to be humble. Help us, O Lord God, to admit our mistakes and our wrongs and to have the wisdom to seek out ways to improve in those areas so we can be better people, not only to ourselves, but our relationships as well as to the world because you said, O Lord God, that they would know us by our love not by our preaching, not by our teaching, not by our color swatches or anything else. You said that they would know us by our love. Help us, O oh Lord God, to live in such a way that they will know who we are. Come run into the Heavenly Father. Thank you, O oh Lord God, for doing these things. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. We'll close with this one statement and then we can go home. I forgot to tell you about the vision that had been given as the war was getting on the back end of coming to a close, the person said that there was a monster that had come up. And it says the monster ran to me and hit me in my chest with such force that I just rolled over way back across the field, way across the field. That, that, that vision that was given was about the things that I was going to begin to experience within and without. Because it says that the force of this thing stunned me same way I, I was stunned for the last kind of few weeks here um, just as many things were hitting me from different sides I was like where's all of this coming from and the person said that the thing hit me back and I rolled back like a tumbleweed and everything and I was just stunned but then they, but then they, they said I started coming to myself and I looked up and saw what hit me and they said in the vision I, came, I became very angry at what hit me this monster and it says that I just shook myself off and then, like David, I started running for that monster to strike him again. And they said that as I started running towards that monster to return the favor, they said a weapon came out of my being. And they said, we don't, I don't even know what this thing is. You can't call it a sword. You can't even hardly call it a weapon. They said, but something started forming out of you when you ran toward that thing. And the weapon and the vengeance that you walked in, it shattered him into a million pieces. And so that thing that came out of me was this new anointing that just dropped on me to return the favor. I got hit by some things. We were in the midst of a war, in the midst of a war, in the midst of a war. And you can't, you know, people say religious, oh, we fighting the devil, we on the battlefield. No, you're not. You're in the living room in the country. Because when you're in a real battle, that's not how you talk. We on the battlefield for the Lord. We on the battlefield for, no, that's not how you talk. When you're in a real battle, sometimes you're quiet. Sometimes you're sitting at home in the dark and you don't know what is going on when you're in a real battle. You understand what I'm saying? So we're getting ready to do some things very, very powerful. Stay connected, get involved. But, 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 y'all, we're really getting ready to do something amazing. And I'm looking forward to it. How about you? Just a couple of announcements as we leave. Uh, we have the inner healing and deliverance training, two separate ones. The fundamental of inner healing, that starts on Tuesdays, uh, January 31st. That's next week, isn't it? Yeah, this week. Oh, yeah, that's, ooh. Yeah, that's, is it Tuesday? Uh, yes, it's Tuesday. Take a picture of the thing. You can figure it out later on, okay? Six-week course on inner healing, the fundamentals of it. The re take the information at the bottom. And then the next graphic is them doing a deliverance training. This is how you learn how to kick the devil in the teeth. And, and two-week course on Thursdays about deliverance. That, Benny Hinn said something. He said that will be the main issue of the church. There is a small revival beginning to kick out amongst people that have sidestepped the pastor since you won't let me do it. 
and they're just doing, they're going on the streets in droves and just casting demons out, just casting demons out. And so, uh, so I'm very uh, excited about what we're getting ready to do. And so we'll get training for that. If you're interested in that, just take a picture of it. So let's lift our hands. Father, in Jesus' mighty name, we give you thanks and praise. Online, you can go ahead and switch to the salvation video. We give you glory and honor and praise, O oh Lord God. Hey, thank this is Otha with Lionheart Church. I want to thank you for tuning in to the broadcast on today. And there may be someone out there that on today you find yourself in need of salvation or rededication or you may not be sure that you are saved. The Bible says these things are written so that you may know. So before I pray with you, I'd like to go over a couple of scriptures. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says that if you would believe in your heart that Jesus died for you and you would accept that, say that in the form of a prayer, you would be saved. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says that salvation is not something that you can work for, but it is a gift of God to be received freely. And then my favorite is 1 John 1, 9. It says that if you would confess your sins, God would be faithful and just to forgive you of all of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So that's what the word says on that matter. So if you'd like to get in on this prayer for one of those three things that I mentioned, uh, wherever you are, if you're in your car, whether you're in your living room or in a place, um, just go ahead and just repeat this prayer after me. Say, Father, I accept what your son Jesus did for me on the cross. I thank you for his blood that washes away all of my sins. I receive forgiveness, I receive cleansing, and I take Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Thank you for forgiving me, cleansing me, and making me righteous. Thank you for making me a member of heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, congratulations if you prayed that prayer. I just want to say a prayer over you now, Father, in Jesus' name. Anyone that prayed that prayer on today, I pray that you would fill them with the knowledge of your will, that you would restore unto them anything that the devil has stolen from them. I thank you, Lord, that you would surround them with comfort and safety and protection, and that you would bring them, O oh Lord God, into the perfect knowledge of your will for their lives. Thank you, Lord God, for doing this. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, once again, congratulations, congratulations, congratulations. Hey, if you have any questions, just reach out to us at lionheartchurch.org. We can help speed up your spiritual growth. And once again, God bless you and be blessed.